Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Susan O'Neill, and I'm president of the International Society for Music Education, and I'm the host of today's Thought Leader Session. I'm speaking to you from Vancouver on the west coast of Canada, where I am a settler and an uninvited guest on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, Salatooth, and Coquitlam nations. The thought leader sessions were to be introduced at the 31st, 34th ISMI World Conference in Helsinki as a new conversation series to engage the keynote speakers and others who are central to the conference theme, visions of equity and diversity. Thought leaders are individuals who are recognized as outstanding innovators in their field and as people who have made and make continue to make a positive difference in people's lives. Although we had to cancel the 34th World Conference due to the global pandemic, we are honored to be able to take one of our planned thought leader sessions to this virtual format today. I thank everyone who is joining us live from around the world and also to those who are watching our recorded event on the ISMI YouTube channel. We have an amazing thought leader with us today, Professor Deborah Cheatham, who will be in conversation with another amazing thought leader, Professor Margaret Barrett. They will be focusing on issues connected with the World Conference theme, Visions of Equity and Diversity. And I'm deeply honored to be able to introduce them and to join in this remarkable event. Even though we can't meet in person this week in Helsinki as planned, the need for connection is strong. And we bring you this event as part of a week long program with presentations to uphold our professional responsibility to share significant ideas with music education practitioners and scholars. Today we were joined by many people and we thank you all for coming in live and also for watching us uh, our recorded session later. Now for those of you who are tuning in live, you will find a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on this, you'll be able to send in questions during the presentation. And I will read out and get to as many of those questions as we have time for at the end of the session. Just before we get started and I introduce our guests, I have the pleasure of making a special announcement. I'm announcing the official launch of a new special interest group for ISMI. The group is called Decolonizing and Indigenizing Music Education. Indigenous peoples around the world have resisted and survived colonization and systems of oppression. And yet in many nations, Indigenous peoples continue to experience the negative effects of settler and exploitative forms of colonization such as discrimination, inequality, and exclusion. These effects are often reflected in the current music education practices, pedagogies, and curriculum, whether explicit or hidden, of those nations. The purpose of the ISMI Decolonizing and Indigenizing Music Education Special Interest Group is to scrutinize, interrogate, and theorize current colonizing music education practices and counter them by offering alternative approaches that support music education informed by Indigenous perspectives. The four co-chairs of the new SIG are Claire Hall from Monash University in Melbourne, Teoti Rakana from the University of Auckland, David Johnson, a Canadian who's been living in Sweden for the last 10 years and is working on the final stages of his PhD at London University, and Anita Prest, who's at the University of Victoria, here in Victoria, Canada. An Indigenous steering committee comprised of Indigenous peoples from various communities across the globe will guide the SIG's actions. And there will be a news release soon via an upcoming newsletter for you to find out more about the special interest group. And they have a Facebook page that's available with already over, four, over 300 members. We're excited and delighted to bring this new special interest group to ISMI, and we look forward to seeing the ideas and the work that they're doing over the coming years. And, th and so now I'd like to introduce our facilitator for the thought leader session today, Professor Margaret Barrett. Margaret is head of school at the Sir Zalman Cohen School of Music at Monash University in Australia. 
Professor Barrett has most recently served as head of school at the University of Queensland and is a leading figure in Australian and international music education. Currently, Professor Barrett also holds positions as the director of the Australian Music Centre, the Queensland Symphony Orchestra, and the Queensland Music Festival. She has served as president of ISMI in 2012 to 14, chair of the World Alliance for Arts Education, and chair of the Asia Pacific Symposium for Music Education Research, as well as been a long-term board member of ISMI and national president of the Australian Society for Music Education. Margaret will be joined in conversation today with our special guest, who would, we would have been honored to have as our keynote speaker, and we're pleased she's with us today, Professor Deborah Cheatham. Professor Cheatham is an Indigenous Australian Yorta Yorta woman, soprano, composer, and educator. She has been a leader and pioneer in the Australian arts landscape for more than 25 years. In the 2014 Queen's Birthday Honours List, Professor Cheatham was appointed as an Officer of the Order of Australia for her distinguished service to the performing arts as an opera singer, composer, and artistic director, and to the development of Indigenous artists and to innovation in performance. In 2009, Deborah Cheatham established Short Black Opera as a national not-for-profit opera company devoted to the development of Indigenous singers. The following year, she produced the premiere of her first opera, Pecan Summer. This landmark work was Australia's first Indigenous opera and has been a vehicle for the development of a new generation of Indigenous opera singers. In March 2015, she was inducted onto the honour roll of Women in Victoria and in April 2018 received an honorary doctorate from the University of South Australia for her pioneering work and achievements in music. Professor Cheatham has been named the 2020 Composer in Residence for the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, and she is beginning her appointment at the Sir Zalman Cohen School of Music, Monash University, as Professor of Australia Music Practice. I'm delighted to welcome you both today. Thank you for being with us. Thanks so much, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, it is indeed an honour to speak with you, Deborah. And uh, I'm joining uh, not from Melbourne, but from Lutrawitta, which is the Palawakani name for Tasmania. Um, I wanted to, to start our conversation with a little bit about you. You've spoken on many occasions about the power and necessity of music and its role in shaping and sustaining communities. And I wonder if you'd share with us your earliest recollections of music in family, in community, in school. Well, Margaret, uh, I'm speaking to everybody from the lands of the Bunwarang people and uh, I can look out at my window here and see the great bay that stretch, uh, stretches out to uh, eventually to Bass Strait. Uh, so the land of the Eastern Kulin Nations and in particular Nam, and I'm drawing a lot of strength from that land today. Uh, it's important that people know that uh, here in Australia, in Victoria, Australia, we're in uh, a very serious uh, stage of our lockdown process. And uh, I just send my thoughts out to everybody who has been affected by the pandemic uh, in the world and particularly to the elders in our communities who've been targeted so cruelly. Uh, I think at this time I am perhaps more grateful than I've ever been that music has been such an important part of my life. Uh, and I'm particularly grateful to the, to the teachers that were in, uh, in my life early on who could see potential in me and who were not, uh, who were not ever going to discriminate against me in, on the basis of, of, of race, on my, on my Aboriginality. Uh, they were fewer in number than those who would discriminate, but the strength of their belief in me has brought me to where I am today. But music has always been threaded throughout my life. In fact, I have to say, Margaret, it's, it's certainly my earliest memory. Uh, I can remember as a very small child, 
uh, leaning up against my mother in church and <clears throat> feeling the breath go in and out as she would sing a hymn. And uh, those very, very early memories stay stay embedded in me in a, in a spiritual and in a, a physical way. Uh, I can't remember a time when I wasn't singing. It's been absolutely essential to uh, my way of making sense of my, my own belonging in this world. And uh, I think that it's, it's a journey, as I say, I'm very grateful for right at this moment. Uh, although people will be looking at Australia and seeing uh, relatively very low numbers of, of those affected by this pandemic, uh, just this week in, in Melbourne, where I'm living on the Kulin, uh, the lands of the Eastern Kulin Nation, uh, it became impossible to leave home without a permit. And this has triggered something very deep in me as a Yorta Yorta woman, knowing that uh, my mother, her mother, lived with decades of, uh, of, of deprivation uh, in terms of the liberty to move from place to place. We're also living under a curfew at the moment from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m., something that my grandmother would have known as an Aboriginal woman, as a Yorta Yorta woman, for decades. So as we have this conversation today, Margaret, I've, I have this I have elevated my my knowledge of the fact that Aboriginal people in Australia have have suffered so terribly from um, limitations to their freedoms for so long. I've gone from knowing that, from being uh, a descendant of that, to actually experiencing it. And in that experiential journey, I have reached an understanding that I, I thought I'd already arrived at. So. I wanted to contextualize our conversation today because the person sitting in front of the screen this morning is altered, is changed forever really by this, this experience which I realize my grandmother and my mother and First Nations people around Australia would have known uh, in the decades uh, of their lives where everything had been taken. But the one thing that wasn't taken was their identity, which was embedded in this land and their experience of their identity, which was expressed through all the arts, but in particular music. So with that context, I hope I've also managed to somehow answer your first question, but I can't actually, I can't shrug that off week um, something has been triggered in me that's a very deep sadness really at the moment but also something that drives my determination to make sure that in all of this we do not lose sight of the fact that fundamental to a way of knowing is music I think that that really contextualizes it powerfully for all of us at the moment you you describe yourself as a 21st century urban woman, yorta yorta by birth, stolen generation by government policy, soprano by a whole lot of hard work and diligence, <laughs> and composer by necessity. That necessity. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, well, uh, that's my most recent bio, Margaret. And of course, I also add at the end of that, lesbian by practice. But um, uh, look, after years of having really long bios and some of them being up to date and some of them being out of date, I thought, what, it, what is it I want to say at 55 years of age? What is the essence of who I am? And uh, that short bio that you've read there is what it came down to uh, last year when I was about to give the Peggy Glanville Hicks address in Melbourne. I really wanted to just drill down into what the sum of the parts had been up to this point in my life. Uh, composer by necessity, you know, it took me a long time actually to add the word composer to, to, my, uh, to my little email signature, you know. 
I had soprano there, of course, artistic director of Short Black Opera, our national indigenous opera company, and various other titles uh, along the way. But composer was one, I don't know, it just, it just took me a long time to accept that what I was doing uh, was indeed uh, the role of a composer in our society. You see, 10 years ago, uh, come this October, we premiered Australia's first Aboriginal opera. Now I say Aboriginal because it was a story from mainland Australia. There are many words that we use to, ex uh, to uh, describe uh, First Nations people in Australia and at, at times some are in favour and some fall out of favour. Aboriginal, Indigenous. Uh, I, I refer to myself as a Yorta Yorta and a Ewan soprano and uh, I'll talk about the Ewan part uh, a little later on if we get back to it. But um, to add that title of composer, you know, even though in, in 2010 when we premiered Pekan Summer, my first opera, I was, I was writing that opera out of necessity because in that classical uh, vocal space there had not been a consistent uh, Indigenous voice. There had not been the kind of opportunity that we thought would have flowed from, well, I, I'm not the first Indigenous opera singer in Australia, Harold Blair, a great tenor from Sherberg Mission up in Queensland, uh, had, uh, had that honour. A very successful singer, uh, won many prizes, toured the world was also a music teacher and in fact when his career uh, ended he went back to music teaching as his first love and so uh, he was a man in the uh, in the in the 60s and the 70s who'd had this career you'd think that the uh, that the legacy of that would have uh, flowed to other indigenous singers wanting to pursue a career in uh, in opera or other classical vocal styles but it hadn't it hadn't because Australia hadn't really moved on. It had remained recalcitrant uh, in its denial of um, of our basic rights as as human beings, uh, and and there was so much more work to do. And by 2010, or even a little bit earlier than that, I decided that you know here I'd had my career already 20 something years as a soprano. Where were the other sopranos, the mezzos, the tenors? Where was the rest of the cast? And I thought the only way to really, to really shift uh, that boundary, that barrier, was to create an opera that would firstly uh, resonate with Indigenous Australians, uh, a story that they could relate to, and secondly, to create uh, a story that would demand a large cast so that we would, uh, so that we would go out there, we would find the singers, of which there were many, We've got all other genres of music covered, uh, but classical music, no. And so I decided that I'd write a story for a large ensemble. We'd go out there and find the singers and we would uh, provide the necessary training to transition from whatever style they were singing in. And uh, Peak and Summer was born. And it was out of necessity because we, we, had, to, we had to break through for those singers who, and we found so many who who early on in their lives they dreamt of singing in an operatic style but the opportunity hadn't been there. So we created Pecan Summer. This year it's 10 years old. Uh, uh, I can say that um, with a very heavy heart actually only in the last couple of weeks our 10th anniversary production we've had to uh, unfortunately cancel those performances because we won't be able to bring an audience together. Uh, to celebrate, but I can uh, tell you that we've decided that we will record the opera and ABC uh, Classic uh, have come on as a partner for that. So, uh, you know, the necessity, the necessity to create the opera in the first place, to provide opportunities to uh, First Nations singers, to provide the training, uh, and then uh, to provide the pathway into uh, into you know the future and into careers that have real meaning and um, and and are in uh, you know embedded in the broader 
musical life of Australia. That's that's our goal, and Short Black Opera has worked very hard um, to achieve that goal. And there are a number of our singers. In fact, I think uh, in total to date there are six singers who have uh, gone through their undergraduate training, received their performance degrees, uh, their BMUS degrees, and um, are out there uh, singing in uh, other companies uh, apart from Short Black Opera. So we're very, very pleased with that result. You're certainly a, a champion of Australian music, but I wonder what does that mean in the 20th century, 21st century? What, what for you is Australian music? I'm really so excited about Australian music. It's it's so completely diverse. We have such an incredible, uh, an incredible array of voices. Young emerging composers particularly really excite me. Uh, there are a lot of uh, women who are um, who are finding that um, they have a voice through composition and are writing the most extraordinary and beautiful music. Uh, some of the music very pushing the boundaries to the very limit of what we might consider music to be. And, um, and for once, finding that uh, we can actually be proud and be proud of and celebrate our own identity as Australians. Now, one thing that I'm really encouraged by is is the work that uh, young Indigenous composers are starting to produce, and uh, I've been very proud to mentor one or two of them. And I, I might I might mention in particular one composer. Her name is Brenda Gifford, uh, a Yuan woman, and uh, I guess uh, it, here's the point. Here's Brenda as a well-known jazz musician uh, for some. 15, 20 years, but always with a fascination for classical music. And so provided with that opportunity uh, through a, a program initiated by the Australian Music Centre, Nara Buria, she has been able to expand her voice into the classical realm and, and, and some of the most extraordinarily beautiful music. But we have such a, uh, we have such a diverse uh, uh, range of stories here in Australia and I think um, what I'm really enjoying at the moment Margaret is I'm not hearing the words mainstream so much anymore two of my least favorite words when they come together mainstream what is that what is that I'm mainstream of my own life your mainstream of your life and if we come together you know we create something really powerful and unique and beautiful or we can there's the potential there so I'm I'm really celebrating the fact that we have so many emerging composers to add to the legacy of of composers who've been working you know throughout the last 230 years here and of course throughout the last 2000 generations because Australia celebrates the longest continuing music practice in the world and 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 that is something that I think our our younger arts community is celebrating in a way that uh, I, I'm relieved to see them celebrating and acknowledging that fact uh, it's taken a long time and and I think that it will it will sustain us through you know the current the current crisis and also it will sustain us to to move towards an Australian identity that is more broadly celebrated rather than always reaching for the Western canon of music. Now I'll just say straight away that I don't see those two things as mutually exclusive but I think we have excluded the Australian voice for some time and that that is changing in my lifetime I, I'm thrilled that I'm part of it uh, I'm, I'm honoured. So uh, I think Australian music is, is you walk outside this door, when, you know, not during curfew, obviously, <laughs> uh, and on any normal day, you would see uh, a great array of humanity. And that's what Australia is uh, since, um, uh, you know, since 230 years of uh, colonization and reaching back into 2000 generations. This has always been a multicultural country. 
I mean, for people who are tuning in from um, from other parts of the world outside of Australia, or maybe even from for some Australians tuning in, we need to remember that Australia is a continent on which you could fit all of Europe without touching the sides. You could throw in the UK for good measure if you wanted to. Uh, I don't know how that works out with Brexit, but we live on a continent, and that continent has been home to, the, as I say, the longest music practice in the world. But the many nations of indigenous First Nations people, uh, that in itself is multicultural. So that has been Australia from the very beginning before it was actually known as Australia. It's a long-winded answer, but there's just so much to celebrate in what's, ha in what's being recognised now. I think um, it's a very uplifting time in so many ways. You're such a powerhouse of projects, Deborah, and you've mentioned a few, so the Short Black Opera is, as being one of them. But there are others, like uh, Dungala Children's Choir, uh, the One Day in January project. Could you tell us a little bit about those projects and, and your intentions with them? I'm so proud of it. I'm going to wheel back in my chair and reach back to get this book. A little bit of product placement there. Okay. But um, this has been one of the proudest achievements. The Dungala Choral Connection Songbook, which uh, was written originally for Dungala Children's Choir, uh, a choir that began on my grandmother's country, on Yorta Yorta country. So if you're imagining a map of Australia and Victoria being down a little thin slice down the bottom of Australia, Yorta Yorta country is right up on a river we call the Dungala hence the name of the choir and, and this book. Dangala is uh, more recently known as the Murray River, which is Australia's longest river, but the Dangala has been home to the Yorta Yorta for you know, 70,000 years plus, and uh, my grandmother's country. And uh, uh, it was really important to me in re-establishing my connection to, to my grandmother's country. As you mentioned before, Margaret, I'm stolen generation, so I was forcibly removed from my Aboriginal mother uh, at three weeks of age. Uh, so that journey, that great arc of a journey to find my way back to my belonging um, has always been driven by music and is sustained on Yorta Yorta country by the Dungala Children's Choir a choir that uh, my partner Tony and I have run for the last 12 years uh, and uh, of, of beautiful Yorta Yorta children coming together, making the most incredible unison sound. Uh, they sing in harmony as well, but they've got this incredible sound that is, is so, it, it's, it's unique to, to the people who who've, who've are descendants of, I think the Dungala River and the Barma Forest, the largest uh, river red gum forest in the Southern Hemisphere. So there's something about the way language is formed. Uh, it uh, it's informed by the geography that uh, that it grows out of, and it's something that that's done to the shape and the sound of these voices. So Dungala Children's Choir began on Yorta Yorta Country 12 years ago. Four years ago, we extended that down to Wuthering Country, which is also known as Geelong and up to Bendigo even. And uh, so we have two chapters of the choir and they come together for, for many projects. And, and I get so enthusiastic about them, Margaret, because really those kids are a reason to get up in the morning. They're just, uh, I don't know, they, they, they absolutely fill me. I, one of the things that I, I haven't included in that short bio, that you mentioned at the beginning or even in the longer form is that I spent the first 20 years of my career as a high school music teacher. My undergraduate degree was from the Conservatorium of Music in Sydney and uh, it was a Bachelor of Music Education. So uh, it's something that I'm incredibly passionate about. And um, on more than one occasion that, uh, that children's choir, Dungala Children's Choir has been uh, my refuge because uh, although my career has taken me in many other directions and that that daily commitment that teachers make to their students is is no longer something that I, that I'm able to do uh, I I really couldn't I really couldn't let go of the opportunity to 
to to learn from young people and to impart what I know to them. So Dangala Children's Choir is a very important part of Short Black Opera, as well as the larger company. And uh, just um, just this year, we've established uh, a new ensemble to break into. Uh, I think might be the final frontier for. Uh, uh, First Nations people in the world of classical music. I don't know if you want to talk about that right now, Margaret, but oh, Ensemble, Ensemble Dutala is uh, is our latest uh, uh, project. We've, uh, as as a composer, of course, I'm working with with many ensembles throughout Australia. I'm I'm very honoured to be the composer in residence for MSO. I would have loved it to be just about any other year than 2020, but there you have it. <laughs> 2020 is my year. And uh, I, I look out at these ensembles I'm working with, the Flinders Quartet, the Goldners, uh, Plexus Ensemble, Rubik's, some of these incredible uh, uh, new and emerging uh, ensembles and, and the established ones, Sydney Phil, uh, the SSO. And I think, um, sorry, Sydney Symphony Orchestra. And I don't see any Aboriginal musicians. I don't see any Torres Strait Islander musicians. I don't see First Nations people in the orchestras. I don't see them in the organisations either, but they're in the first desk of the violin. Will, will I see a First Nations uh, uh, concert master? Uh, and I hadn't. And it, it's, it, it really went to the heart of, uh, you know, way back in the day, before I was a singer, I was actually a flautist. And uh, I I worked very hard at that. I was never going to really get uh, as far as I, I would have liked to, but I was looking out there and, and knowing what it takes to, 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 to rise to that um, elite level to be in one of our state orchestras. And I thought for a First Nations person, uh, this just never going to happen unless we're able to create an environment where they they feel that uh, they are culturally supported uh, and that they can continue their studies with the hope of one day having a career and if they could never see that how could they ever possibly hope to be that so short black opera has established ensemble dutala dutala is a, a word from my grandmother's language the yorta yorta language and it means star-filled sky. And uh, we have uh, an ensemble of nine at the moment, 10 if you count me, but gosh, you know, if ever there was a, a, if ever there was an example of, if you don't use it, you lose it. My flute playing is that, but I, I'm there anyway. Uh, but the rest of the, the musicians are, are all classically trained First Nations musicians, some who have played casually with orchestras at times, uh, one of our colleagues, of course, from um, from Monash, Aaron Wyatt, is an exceptional violist. Played with the West Australian Symphony Orchestra casually for 12 years. Well, now he's the director of Australia's first uh, Indigenous uh, chamber orchestra. Very proud to uh, to have launched that program in the last couple of weeks. So, once again, through necessity. Uh, if you're wondering, you know, why it's so important for Indigenous people to have that culturally safe place, it's it's such a large conversation, we'd never contain it here. But there are still boundaries that we're pushing through, even in the 21st century, um, because Australia has really lived in denial of uh, its beginnings for so long. Uh, and and it's, it's not just that we that Australians didn't know how this country came to be 230 years ago. It, it was fed a complete uh, uh, false uh, idea of how Australia uh, was settled. Even that word settled is such an affront. Uh, this world, uh, this, uh, this Australia that we know um, was uh, brutally taken from the First Nations people and many, many lives were lost in conflicts uh, in, in the early days of colonisation and still through to this day uh, where Aboriginal people can, uh, can 
they live in fear for their lives if they are unfortunate enough to be incarcerated for any period of time because we see black deaths in custody uh, not uh, not diminishing but those numbers ever rising so aboriginal people are still uh, still have many battles to to fight here and that's that's why music is such a powerful tool i feel such a powerful tool and that's why not only to to sing whatever genre we liked but to play our instruments in whatever genre we like and to protect uh, young First Nations, Indigenous, Aboriginal, Torres Strait, Yorta Yorta, whatever other nation, to protect them through their development and to to lead them uh, to into the career that they want to have um, is is absolutely my my focus right now. And I'm very lucky to have a colleague like Aaron Wyatt, uh, as I say, such an exceptional violist to uh, lead that ensemble. From what you've been saying, Deborah, there are so many different threads coming through your, your commitment to education um, and the continuing development. Your reference is just there to the, the hidden memories and, if you like, the repressed history of Australia. And it brings to mind your recent work, Eumorella, A War Requiem for Peace, which tells a story of a brutal war that place on Gunditjmara lands in some 170 years ago. Would you tell us a little more about that work and your intentions with it? Sure. Well, you'd think that if a brutal war had been fought on your country, you would know about it. But most Australians don't know about the Umarala Wars. Uh, Gunditjmara country, I'd say it would be about two thirds of the size of Germany. It's pretty big, pretty big country. Remember, Australia is a continent, as I said before. And on this uh, land of uh, the Gunditjmara people, the lands of the Gunditjmara people rather, uh, southwest of Melbourne, prob probably from around about Colac down to what is now a border with South Australia and even a little bit beyond that. Uh, at the beginning of colonization in Victoria, which was later than New South Wales, um, but much earlier than Western Australia, uh, there were some incredible... <laughs> Sadness doesn't, doesn't sum it up, what happened to the Gunditjmara people, but the massacres which gave rise to the conflict known as the Umarala War, um, there's one famous, very famous massacre known as, uh, that took place on a, uh, the Convincing Ground. Uh, the Convincing Ground was the site of the brutal slaughter of men, women and children from one of the Gunditjmara tribes uh, on the recommendation of the then governor of Victoria, uh, who having received many complaints from the squatters that the blacks just wouldn't get out of the way, uh, the governor of the day simply said, well then convince them. And this was code for just kill them. And so the regular shooting parties would go out after church on a Sunday and they would rack up numbers of deaths and write about them in their journals and right home to the mother country, England, to boast about the deaths, the rising death toll. The Gunditjmara fought back. I mean, wouldn't you? And uh, so the battles began in the 1840s and lasted through to around about 1863. When the, uh, when that process of colonization began on Gunditjmara country, it was estimated that there were something like 9,000 Gunditjmara people. There would possibly have been quite a few more, but the numbers were approximate. 9,000 Gunditjmara. At the end of the conflicts and the massacres and the dispossession, there were just 77 Gunditjmara remaining. 77. They were rounded up and put onto a mission station, uh, a 
place called Lake Conda. I visited Lake Conda in uh, 2013 and I have never known such uh, a haunted landscape. I've never known such dis-ease, unrest to come out of a landscape. I've felt things before and it's not the only place where massacres have happened but down there on Lake Condar I really felt it. It's like it came at me as a shout out of the landscape and uh, I was fortunate to to have the guidance of one of the senior elders, senior elders of the Gunditjmara, Uncle Ken Saunders, who who noticed a visible change in my demeanour uh, upon my arrival at Lake Condar. And he just put his hand on my shoulder and said, are you okay? And I said, well, no, not really. I can feel the distress coming out of this land. And it was then he sat me down and he taught me about the Umarella Wars. Now, I'm sharing that story because I want Australians who are hearing this story for the first time to take confidence from the fact that I'm willing to tell you I didn't know. And I don't bear any shame for not knowing because we weren't meant to know. <laughs> There's been a deliberate suppression of knowing in this country which has led us to the brink of really identity crisis, if not <laughs> really having launched over the edge into identity crisis in this country. I didn't know this important story. So if you don't know it, don't feel, don't feel any shame. Don't feel afraid of not knowing. I mean, I used to say this to my students all the time. Don't be afraid of not knowing. Be afraid of having no curiosity, of not bothering to find out. Be afraid of that, but don't be afraid of not knowing. You can be led to knowing, but beyond that, I wanted to lead myself and others from knowing about the Umarella Wars into understanding them. And the clearest pathway from knowing to understanding is experience, as I mentioned earlier. And if you intensify that with music, then you will embed that understanding very deeply uh, in those who come along for that journey. And so Umarella, a war requiem for peace, was my response to that early experience on Lake Conda and learning of the wars that took place. I thought that the the kind of scaffolding, the framework of a, a war of a requiem and taking the influence of uh, Benjamin Britten's war requiem would be the perfect uh, vehicle for this for this story. Um, and early on, I, I made the decision that the entire thing should be sung in Gunditjmara. I knew of the work of uh, Auntie Vicky Cousins and her father before her of um, revitalizing the language of the Gunditjmara. Uh, many of our languages are uh, were on the brink of uh, extinction. Um, well, that's one language for it, but they were buried very very deep let's just say our languages for safekeeping and the revival of those languages is is difficult um, uh, to say the least but Vicky Cousins had done a lot of work so I felt confident that I could write a work in Gunditjmara language um, language being so formed by the geography as I mentioned earlier uh, the geography of the Gunditjmara uh, lands is is one of um, uh, uh, vast numbers of volcanoes. Uh, in fact, the Gunditjmara have, uh, have have stories passed down through generations of the last great explosion of Baj Bim, which uh, formed so much of the uh, volcanic landscape there. And uh, it's this volcanic landscape that had shaped the Gunditjmara language. So I was very keen to use that as the uh, the, as the rhythmic vocabulary for the piece and uh, Vicky very early came on board but at first what I had planned to do was translate the the Latin text of the Requiem uh, into English there are many translations that I could have used and then translate from there into Gunditjmara but I was actually at the Banff Centre <laughs> 
<laughs> in Canada working on this when I realized that I simply couldn't use the text from the the uh, the Latin mass that we were mostly familiar with I couldn't use it I got to the fifth movement uh, the Agnus Dei where where I was translating Agnus Dei qui tollis peccata mundi which is that um, imagery of the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world who was sacrificed for our sins now as important as this iconography is to the Christian faith and I don't disrespect that at all but I could not use that for this story because those Gundichamara 9,000 people that were reduced to 77 why had they been massacred to make way for the sheep to graze on their lands it was the Gundichamara who'd been sacrificed for the sheep and so at that point there I was sitting in in the in the Banff Centre in, in a wonderful in the late artist colony and ready to write this work and I had to turn it completely upside down and it was then that I developed the text for Eumorella a war requiem for peace that responded more directly to the true history rather than trying to shoehorn Australia into some Western um, European or, 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 or British notion of who we are and our identity we can't it's just too small for 2000 generations of history and it's just too small for the 230 years of colonization that we've lived here and so that had to be expanded and so I wrote the new text and Vicky and um, Travis Ira a linguist from Melbourne translated this 80 minutes of Gundichmara uh, of Gundichmara text we premiered down on country not far from Lake Conda and on the day that we premiered the what the elder that gave the acknowledge uh, the welcome to country auntie Denise said to me the country will hear its language for the first time in 170 years Deborah, unfortunately, we don't have time for, for 80 minutes of it, but I do believe you've got a small section of the work that you could share with us at this point. Yes, this is, um, so this is movement 14. Uh, Pen Mial is, Pen Mial is the name of uh, the creator for the Gunditjmara people. And uh, this movement fulfills uh, the role of the hostias, if you're familiar with the, the Latin mass. Um, I'll translate for you great spirit in praise we offer you ceremony and songs accept them on behalf of those who we remember on this day great spirit guide them from death to life by the promise made to us by our elders Pen mial kane puri wuka wanutin mayapa kawin balirpin manaki nunampiyi Pangnuti wing wanung tin makatapa. Okay, so I'm going to share screen and uh, you'll forgive me while I do a couple of the things that you need to do. That's Benjamin Northey, our conductor. You will hear the MSO, and this was a side by side performance recorded in Hamer Hall last June in 2019, side by side with the Melbourne Youth Orchestra and members of the uh, Melbourne Conservatorium of Music. So here we go. We'll give it a moment. You'll see some art appear on the screen behind. <laughs>
that's Dungala Children's Choir there. just uh, fade that there. Um, it was very important to me to have Dungala Children's Choir embedded uh, in that work and as I mentioned before those of you who are familiar with the Benjamin Britten War Requiem uh, you know I took great heart from the fact that uh, he had departed from the the Latin text as well with the poetry of Wilfred Owen to make that relevant to World War One and the destruction of humanity that came out of that conflict and um, also the multiple choirs uh, the large uh, instrumental ensemble and I'm really proud of that performance because uh, because of the side-by-side -side nature uh, you would have seen many young faces there in in key roles in percussion and uh, uh, and uh, across the whole spread of the of the orchestra so um, that's one of the larger movements. There's everything from um, little silent moments, duets, through to uh, through to that moment where we praise Pan Mial and uh, accompanying each movement. I commissioned 19 large-scale works of art that uh, accompany each movement. So they're projected. You might have seen at the beginning of that movement uh, the image of Pan Mial, created by Gundichamara artist. Uh, Tom Day and uh, the impact of having that story told uh, visually uh, and uh, in terms of the, the music that I've written um, brings us closer to to what artistic practice is in a traditional sense which is, is not siloed at all far more uh, integrated and woven together that uh, you know the singer is often the dancer the dancer the painter the painter the storyteller and so um, I'm trying to bring that practice into uh, the way that I create the works that I write. And, and I think that, um, that you, Morella, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of how we brought that together. I'm not only there, also in Queensland uh, later last year, um, up to the University of Queensland, where um, student orchestra and, and choir, and uh, uh, next year, uh, in 2021. It was meant to have been this year, but next year in 2021, uh, in October, we're off to West Australia to perform with um, West Australian Symphony Orchestra. So it's a work that uh, has real resonance for Australia. Um, I think its importance uh, lay in the fact that at every level of creation, it is driven by a First Nations voice. Uh, we've had a lot of composers over the history of Australian music who have developed a fascination <laughs> or uh, hopefully beyond fascination a relationship with Indigenous culture and uh, have have incorporated that into composition and um, that's a really that's a big conversation as well that process because some of those some of those works are more successful than others in, in actually including Indigenous people but um, rather than being included into our own story, <laughs> I think we should be telling our stories. And in order for us to tell our stories in the classical music space, we need we need singers who are trained, we need composers who are trained, we need uh, instrumentalists who can play. And we know what that training is. There isn't a shortcut. And so Short Black Opera is, uh, is helping to uh, guide people on that pathway and make sure it's a safe one for them. Deborah, as you say, we barely scratched the surface of this conversation. And I will say to, to everybody who is um, listening and watching this conversation, the full Umarella may be accessed on uh, YouTube and we'll make sure that that connection is there. I'm going to turn our conversation back to Susan O'Neill at this moment because uh, we're coming up to the hour and unfortunately not enough time. <laughs> we could go for another hour or more. It's been wonderful. <laughs> with you but for the moment back to Susan 
Thank you. Thank you very, very much, both of you. Um, it has been fascinating. I can't believe how fast it's gone by. We do have a number of questions. We have a little, just a little bit of time left. So I'm going to apologize in advance that I can't get to all of the questions that came in today. They, they, people are, are really fascinated and really interested. Um, I think that one of the things, a personal question that might be helpful to teachers is um, someone who, who's writing to say, I struggle with my identity as a teacher teaching music of my colonizers. What advice would you give someone like me who has no other way to earn my bread and butter? And I might just add that, uh, an extension to that, that I'm, I'm really thinking too, Deborah, about what you see as, as the, the role of music education, perhaps in recognition of Indigenous people and then moving us, I know we have a long way to go, but trying to move us towards reconciliation and then ultimately to resurgence. Truth telling is so important. You need to know your history and that will then provide you with a context. I don't see the Western canon and the music that's emerging from Indigenous composers as mutually exclusive. As an example, I'm curating the Australian series for, um, for Canberra, Canberra Symphony Orchestra next year. And I've invited, uh, although I can't reveal the details of the program, but I've invited several non-Indigenous composers who have written works uh, that have referenced Indigenous culture a long time ago in their practice to to come back to that work and speak to that work. We'll play the work and we'll also share what the journey has been for that composer because we're we're evolving and and to 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 remain stuck in a situation of not knowing is just unacceptable. Yeah. There's not, nothing wrong with admitting that you don't know something, but you must then secure that knowledge and hope that life will ex extend to you the, the opportunity, the experience to move into understanding. That's what I would hope for. So um, uh, we contextualize. We contextualize the, 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 the music of our colonizers. I mean, I, I, I don't know. The, the, the British colonized Australia. And um, I did reference Benjamin Britten before, but apart from Benjamin Britten, I, I don't know whether I, I, I teach the music of our colonizers, but I, um, I suppose that I do. But I, I really feel that they're not mutually exclusive, but it has to be contextualized. Um, you know, I know we don't have time, but I, there was this one moment that I had an opportunity, the first time that we performed anything from Umarella. It was, a, it was in a piano quintet version, and I was performing with the Australian String Quartet, and very fortunate to have my, my beautiful partner, Tony, playing for me. And we were launching the Biennale of 2017 in Venice, and we were in the uh, Scuola Grande di San Rocco, one of the most magnificent palaces of art in Venice. And we were about to perform something in the language of the Gunditjmara people. And I thought to myself, when Tintoretto was painting this ceiling, Gunditjmara were going about their lives speaking this language. What will it be like to speak this ancient language in this old setting? It was perfect. There was a unity. Why? Because we have to see life as a continuation. Not that we drop in and out but that we're part of a thread that continues. And we can, what I would hope for Australians in my final message is that we can come to a level of understanding that allows us to see that we are part of the continuation of the longest music practice in the world. That's beautifully put and uh, it's most appreciated. We have um, come to the end of our time. Like I said, it went incredibly fast, but I just want you to know how deeply we've appreciated that you gave us this time today, that you shared with us um, many things that are going to be not only meaningful to, for Australians, but for every one of our members who's going to be, we're going to be watching this and others from around the world where indigenous people have, have also um, suffered this, these kinds of colonizing practices. And there's much work to do. You give us great hope. A heartfelt thank you to you and to Margaret 
Thank you very much for the wonderful conversation today. And thank you all for joining in. We missed you terribly not being able to be together in Helsinki. But stay well. Kitos. Kitos. <laughs> Kitos. Yes, from, from Finland. And stay well, everyone. Take good care of yourselves and all those under your umbrella of care. Bye-bye.